Hey, Luke, how's it going? Good, thank you, Alexei. How are you? Great. Super excited to have you here. Um, it's been ages. Uh, we used to study at Loughborough together, and then we connected a few months ago at the Fast Growth Icons event in London, which is an amazing dinner. Yeah, yeah. Crazy, right? Crazy. After all those years, we just turn up next to each other on the same table. Um, yeah, awesome event and, and really good to be back in contact. Yeah, awesome. And obviously, since you left university, you had a really cool um, career in the debt financing world, um, initially at Barclays and then at Silicon Valley Bank and now HSBC Innovation, which acquired SVB, right? So I guess to jump straight into some of the drama, maybe, right? Um, you were at SVB when this event happened, which then led to HSBC acquiring it. Again, don't want to make obviously a whole podcast episode about that, but maybe briefly, how did it unravel and how did you feel and, you know, what did you go through? Sure, sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's weird that I've worked for three banks. I stayed at Barclays for eight years and then within a very short space of time now, I've worked for three banks. But yeah, it was a, it was a crazy weekend. Um, obviously, you know, pretty traumatic for everyone involved, right? And, and that includes employees and, and customers of the bank. Um, in the UK, it was, it was, you know, primarily a one-day thing, right? On the Friday where um, the bank run was happening in the UK. And um, for me personally, actually, I was really sick on the Thursday. Like we had a, as you know, I, I've, I've got a young son and he was nine months old. He had a sick bug, which unfortunately gave to me and my wife and we were all really unwell. And it was honestly like the first time I can remember where I didn't look at either of my phones for 24 hours. I was just so sick. I was either in bed or on the bathroom floor. No idea what was going on. Kind of like, kind of had some some rumblings Thursday morning of like what might be happening. I was so sick for the rest of Thursday. Um, woke up Friday morning, like, right, let's go to work. And then suddenly saw what was unfolding. So yeah, tough, tough day. Um, spent most of the time just, you know, supporting clients, helping them get their cash out. Um, and then, you know, over the weekend, you start to pause and realize what it means for you personally. And, and I don't think any of us did that until the Saturday mornings. Friday was just, you know, focus on the clients. Um, but fortunately, you know, financial regulation did its job, the sort of stuff that we studied together. Um, it all worked and, and HSBC stepped up as a fantastic partner. I think any time where M&A of that size happens in that shorter space, I honestly think it might have been the biggest M&A transaction to ever happen in a weekend. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I think I think you know they've been fantastic when you consider that, and uh, and since then we've migrated clients over onto the HSBC platform. Uh, I really feel like we're in a you know a better place than we were before. We've got a much bigger platform, much bigger toolkit to offer to clients, but we're still very much the same business and look after clients in the same way. So, yeah, challenging time, but glad to say it's in the rearview mirror and, and we've moved on and we're in a good place. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. And I guess for the, the audience is actually mostly uh, American founders here. And uh, although, of course, lots of UK ones as well, but in the US, obviously, First Citizens Bank acquired SVB. And then in the UK, HSBC acquired SVB. And so a lot of startups and a lot of companies who had a debt facility with SVB probably had it both in the UK and the US. So does it mean that the ones now basically, you know, the, the co companies have first citizen in the US as a partner and then in the UK they have HSBC, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think um, they would have SVB in the US and they would have HSBC, IVB in the UK. So we had a lot of customers who, you know, splits both ways, right? It might be a US corporate that had a UK subsidiary in the UK. We wouldn't have known too much about that in the UK before. We'd use our bank accounts, but it would be relationship managed over in the US. And likewise, you might have a UK corporate that had a US subsidiary. We would relationship manage the whole thing from the UK. So post March 2023, mm -hmm. when when the two firms split, then those clients would have their bank accounts split apart, and you'd have two different relationship managers. Right. So right. Uh, a lot of work to be done on on both sides of uh, of the pond. Mm -hmm. And the SVB brand actually still exists in the US, basically. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. So they actually went a slightly different route to HSBC. They didn't. They didn't rebrand it. Um, okay. Gotcha. All right. Awesome. Well, we're here to talk about equity versus debt, right? And ideally, how to unlock growth without giving away too much control, which mm -hmm. 
probably in this environment, everyone struggles to fundraise and would probably be happy to give away a lot of control if they can get the funding uh, yeah. for it. Uh, but having said that, uh, and having raised myself a lot of revenue-based financing, um, non-dilutive financing can be super, super helpful and can really give you a lot of growth without you basically diluting your ownership. So maybe let's start with why should a founder actually consider not going down the equity route, but maybe the, the debt route? And then we can kind of talk about the different debt instruments and you know the type of facilities there are, because there are actually many, many. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I'm going to try not to be too biased here, right? Because you've introduced me as a, as, a, as a lender. But to be honest, I think that like, they're totally different forms of capital and they can be relevant at different times. So on the equity piece, you know, if you you go, I think a lot of founders, they they raise a bit of angel funding to get them off the ground or they do like a friends and family raise. It gets them to a certain point, that cash starts to run out. And then the plan A is always, right, I'm going to go and raise equity. And that's the hardest time to raise equity, right? Before you've got maybe full product market fit or you've got product market fit, but you haven't quite got full traction. Revenues might not quite be at the scale you want to be at when you want to raise equity. That's when investors are going to be taking the most risk, right? So that's when you're going to be diluted the most heavily. Um, and it's just it's just a hard time to raise equity. You know, pre-Series A is, is tough. Um, Series A now, you know, typically you're seeing high single digits, low double digits for Series A. So it's, it's quite a mature business by that point. Um, going out before that and looking to raise a seed round, you can very quickly give away a large part of your cap table. So I think it's really important any founder goes out and has that mindset when they're looking to raise equity. And of course, you've got to explore all the other options. So um, yeah, I think I think you know certainly at that stage, looking at non-dilutive forms of capital is is really really important. Um, but that's not to say that equity doesn't play a really important role. You know, we work with a very large number of VC backed companies. Probably makes up 60, 70 percent of our client base at HSBC IVB. Um, yeah, equity providers are fantastic. They can put their arms around you. They can help guide you. They can help achieve certain goals. But you don't want to bring them in too early because mm -hmm. you might give away half your company. Mm -hmm. But in terms of, and we'll probably discuss it in more detail, uh, let's say venture debt on the one hand and then revenue-based financing on the other hand, um, both of these instruments, do you provide them to actually companies before they even raise this seed round? I think like a lot of people usually think, and I think that's also the case that most of the time, especially in venture debt, you kind of need an equity partner already on the cap table. Um, with revenue-based financing, it's it's different, right? You can just underwrite basically based on your revenue and your unit economics, but you then have to have product market fit already, right? And and really good revenue traction. So Correct. maybe maybe just just elaborate maybe on the kind of stages where you guys start playing a role. Yeah, yeah, sure. So. So at HSBC IVB, we wouldn't normally start to lend until a company reaches its Series A. And at that point, unless the company reached profitability or break even very early on, then we might have some options. But let's assume you're pursuing growth, you know, you're burning cash in your early years. Um, we wouldn't normally start to lend until the company reaches Series A. And that's when we could start to offer a venture debt product. So really quickly, what, what would that look like? Typically, we lend up to sort of 25, 35% of the equity that's gone into the business. Uh, we would look to provide it alongside an equity round most of the time. We, we can come in sort of, you know, a year or two after you've last raised, but the best time is to come in alongside the equity partner. The benefit is that it tops up that equity raise and it increases your runway. So if you need to raise 10 and three of that is through debt and seven is through equity, that's, you're going to get much less diluted than if you raise the full 10 from, from you know, a VC or equity provider. So it definitely plays a role. It can extend out your runway then. You, know, you can raise again within the next couple of years, a bit later on when you've got a slightly higher valuation. Um, but equally, you know, it's, it's only appropriate in our eyes once the company reaches a certain stage and once it has a sponsor, you know, a VC sponsor in there that we can really leverage. Before that, I think you know, there's, there's a bunch of revenue uh, finances in the market who can support. Uh, you probably know the names better than I do. It sounds like you've raised a couple of facilities from them. Um, but before that stage, I think it's excellent to, to look at different forms of capital available because you know those types of facilities are very, very flexible. They can be a little bit more expensive, but they're very, very flexible and you can bring them in uh, early doors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So 
when you say somebody raises, let's say a 10 million round, right? Seven comes through an equity round and then three comes through a venture debt facility. Um, what would be the usual terms on that? For example, just so again, for, for some uh, of the listeners uh, or viewers if on YouTube, um, you know, is it is it kind of like a library plus flax or, you know, plus a kind of warrants? Maybe, yeah, talk about that a bit more. Yeah, so um, there would be a, an interest margin applied. It would depend on which country you're um, you're getting a facility from. It's different on either sides in the US and the UK. Um, but there'd be an interest margin and arrangement fee, which is typically sort of low single digits, like typically, typically sub 2%. Um, and then there's normally a warrant coverage included in the facility. And the reason for that is that the debt risk is effectively quasi equity risk if we're going in alongside a VC companies burning cash uh it might be getting to a point where it only has 24 months of runway but the terms on the facility are typically sort of three to five years so there's a bit of a period on the end where the company potentially isn't funded and we're taking a risk on the company's ability to go and raise that next round of equity to keep the runway going and keep the business you know fully funded um so the warrant is there as a sort of a, a risk reward balance um, however, you know, we can look at every case, case by case, and sometimes there's covenants in there. If there's stronger covenants that give the bank more protection, then the warrant coverage might be lower. Um, you know, it really is case by case. I know it sounds very generic, but it is case by case. Mm -hmm. I, I, I come back to the covenants uh, discussion actually as well, but just to make it a bit more uh, specific then. So let's say arrangement fee sub 2%. Let's say interest rate, whatever, 15%, for example, right? And then you have the warrants, which I think they tend to be around, let's say, 2% of the amount you raise, right? For example. And then the warrants, they usually work where that amount. So let's say, to make it very simple, let's say it's a huge 100 million debt round, 2% warrant. So that's 2 million. And then you divide it 2 million let's say pounds divided by the last equity round valuation, right? To get the number of shares you guys would get at the time of exit or liquidation, right? Is that correct? That's how warrants in your case work. More or less, more or less. Yeah, it differs a little bit country by country and the way different lenders will approach warrants. So um, sometimes it's at the subscription price of, or the subscription price is what the uh, share price was at the last round. Sometimes it's a nominal amount. Sometimes it might be one cent, one penny, one mm. pound, one dollar. Um, so that can have a pretty drastic impact on mm. you know how the how that warrant converts. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's it depends on on the lender you're working with. But certainly, sub two mm. percent coverage would be pretty typical, and um, subscription price sort of varies depending on how the lender sees the risk in in the lender. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so. You obviously you're not allowed to probably call out competitor names, but I am. So let's say <laughs> the competition is the traditional banks, such as you know JP Morgan, CABC. You also have venture debt funds, Clara Capital, actually the founder is an investor in my business as well, Creos, now BlackRock, Hercules. And then you also, I guess, have VC funds who have some sort of allocation to provide as debt as well. Uh, White Star is an example, the Hamburg Perks. How do you differentiate yourself in the market? I guess the rates are probably very similar. So I'd say banks are typically cheaper than funds. So um, it all comes back to that sort of risk versus reward and, and flexibility versus price. So banks, and you know, talking pretty general here because we're trying to cover the US and the UK, so there's always going to be differences. But typically, your bank will be a bit cheaper, but it's going to want to have a little bit more structure to the facility. So that might be covenants or that might be um, other financial terms that give the bank a bit of extra protection and help them with their credit committee approval. Um, funds typically are a little bit higher up on the risk appetite profile. Um, and then, you know, in turn, they're going to ask for a higher warrant coverage or a higher interest margin. Um, so I'd say that sort of general structure, but I guess where there can be differences is different banks and different lenders will use different reference rates, depending on if you're in the US or the UK, that can have a really drastic impact on the all-in rate. Some lenders will quote an all-in rate, others will quote a margin plus you know, a reference rate. 
So um, it, it really varies, but by and large, I'd say banks are cheaper and a bit more structured than a fund. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And then you have revenue-based financing, which um, we actually yeah, use that. We used Wayflyer and we used Uncapped. Um, now, how do you differentiate in that kind of space? So for us, it's not really a space that we directly play in at the moment, um, but it's, it's, it's a super exciting space and it's fantastic. There's so many options available for companies now. Uh, whilst we don't make sort of formal recommendations, they're, they're definitely lenders that we know well and we talk about with clients all the time. You know, part of our job is to not just be able to provide HSBC, IVB products, but actually to be able to talk about different people in market who can support our client. So when you are in that pre-Series A phase and you might need a bit of funding to get to, towards your Series A, or you might just want to keep growing and, and you know bootstrap and eventually get up to profitability. Um, it's our job to try and bring in those partners and make referrals and be helpful. So um, I think that they're, they're really, really useful when you're not yet at a stage where you want to raise your Series A, or if you just don't want to go down that route and you mm -hmm. say, I've got a really workable model here. I've got you know decent traction. I know that I've got a certain client acquisition cost, a certain client lifetime value. And I know that if I just keep feeding the machine, then I will generate continual revenue and, and hopefully eventually continual cash and profit. I think they're phenomenally effective and, and really useful. The downside is that, you know, they, they typically cap out. It's not always the case, but typically they cap out at a lower level than a fund or a bank would. So they're only going to get you so far. Um, also, if you know the way they structure it, there isn't always an interest margin. But if you calculate the interest margin, it can be quite high. I think typically sort of, 10 to 20% is quite common, but I've seen it as high as 40%. So, you know, you've got to be careful, right? You might be signing up for repayments that are X percentage of your revenue. But if that's going on for two years, you might have overpaid the loan by you know 50%, in which case you paid a very high interest margin as a result. Yeah, 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 That that is very true. Yeah, I think a lot of them are actually stepping away from revenue-based, revenue-based, let's say, percentages, even though it's still called like that. And they're basically underwriting the revenue but are keeping it as a percentage of the loan let's say similar to a venture debt except you don't have the the warrants um but yeah. you're right they the amounts tend to be much much smaller than what you can get with venture debt um yeah. i guess you're, you're saying obviously this is an area you guys are looking at and it's really interesting and ironically that whole revenue-based financing space actually probably pioneered with e-commerce companies. And then a lot of the SaaS revenue-based financing guys came up, such as, you know, Pipe and CapChase, et cetera. And a lot of the, again, e-commerce financing guys are now adding way more SaaS companies to their client base than e-commerce. And that's probably also related to the whole Amazon aggregator blow up uh, where a lot of these players lost a lot of money, as well as other venture debt providers as well. And maybe, you know, tell us why do you also got, you know, underwrite mostly software companies and you almost mm -hmm. stay away from e-commerce? I mean, I, I'm sure you have some e-commerce clients as well, but why is software in your view so much better? Yeah, so for sure. So, I mean, we definitely do lend to e-commerce businesses. We call it consumer internet, but it's, you know, it's e-commerce, right? So we're we're across enterprise software, consumer internet, uh, climate and frontier tech, fintech, uh, life sciences, and then the funds that invest into all of those sectors. Um, but we do have specialist products to lend for lending to software. And certainly, you're right, there's, there's a lot more options out in market if you are a software company. The benefit for the lender is that you've got recurring revenue, right? And that's always the sort of the magic term. The ability to look forward and know what your revenue is going to be broadly is incredibly helpful. And, of course, there's going to be some churn there and, and the lender might adjust for that. But being able to extrapolate, right, I know we're going to have this level of cash coming in either on a monthly basis or if you're sort of 12 months up front, then I've got these milestone payments coming up over the next couple of years. That gives the lender confidence that the financial plan is solid and that enables the lender to take an additional risk on the business. Um, you know, in e-commerce, revenue can change day by day and it's, it's very, very competitive. The landscape can change very quickly software you're pretty heavily embedded in the company most of the time you're doing a particular process for them there's always competition i don't think software's ever been so competitive um but it, it you know definitely gives the lender a lot more support mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i guess 
in terms of due diligence, right? When you look at, let's say, a MarTech business where I could argue the growth might be amazing, but the churn might be super high, like 20% month on month, right? Which means every year, the whole client base basically needs refreshing for that SaaS business. And probably it's not these type of SaaS businesses you guys end up, right? But still, what is the due diligence process generally looking like when you guys end up, right? Yeah, so so we have we have probably three products. If we're just talking software, we've got three types of products. One is kind of akin to venture debt, but we're going to put some covenants in there around revenue growth and maybe a multiple of MRR. Typically on that product, we might go up to six times MRR. Can go a little bit higher than that sometimes, but, but six is sort of a good number to aim for. Um, secondly, we have a working capital product where we lend against the balance sheet. And it, it basically is MRR financing, but we lend against the cash and the debtors that are on the balance sheet. Uh, we find it actually just is a bit more flexible for the company. It's a, less likely to breach. It's probably going to be slower to change if your MRR starts to dip slightly. Um, and then the third is, is an MRR financing products where we go up to six times, typically for companies that are over $50 million of revenue, approaching profitability. Um, and that's kind of where we can kind of unlock larger facilities. Through all of those, the underwriting process is pretty similar. So first step would be to ask for a financial, well, first step is to meet the founder, right? And meet the management team. It's always the most important thing. Hear the story, understand that. Second thing would then to be get a financial plan, which involves the PL balance sheet and the cash flow. Normally you want to see that over three years on a monthly basis. So we can really understand where the risks are in the financing plan. Um, we can sensitize it. We can make sure that we understand the business model, uh, the assumptions. I think at that point, it's really helpful if there's a CFO in the business. It doesn't need to be a full-time CFO, but a CFO of some description. Um, someone who is very, very close to the numbers and has a certain level of experience in building these types of models. Uh, really important for the sort of probability of OBS. It's not always the case, but in most cases, the companies we work with are at that stage. Um, and then, you know, let's say we've had that for a week, we come back with a couple of questions after that point, try to refine the case a little bit more, work with the company and explain the things that maybe aren't working so well for us in the financing plan, think about how we might be able to adapt it slightly. And I guess that's really the start of the process where we go towards covenants and financial terms. As we start to do that, we're trying to fit the financing case to our underwriting methodology so that the company can do what it needs to do. That's always the most important thing. But then also, you know, we're making sure we're managing the bank's risk and we're meeting all mm -hmm. of our committee requirements. So yeah, that's that's what the process looks like. And then get through the underwriting process and then we go into documentation. Typically takes, you know, probably a month after that. So all in all, we can wrap up within about six to eight weeks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I guess you don't do the technical due diligence or the digital due diligence or the product due diligence because you most of the time have that VC partner in there. Right, who did all that work, and you probably just request all the documents from them. Correct, correct. Um, there's there's a big range, right, of the documentation and sophistication that's available. Some companies have had, or financial sponsors have had DD done by, you know, a DD firm or an audit firm, and, and that's really helpful. Um, sometimes you get sort of killed with detail, but it's really helpful. Um, I think a lot of the DD is just done in house, right? We know these sectors very well because that's what we specialize in. We work with the management team, kind of normally like to think we know the right questions to ask and delve into the right things. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'd say it's 80% it's what we can do and, and working with the company to get materials. And then if there's anything we can get externally, then that's um, on top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. So you then mentioned a few of these metrics and how you underwrite. And I guess like a lot of the covenants and maybe you can also explain what a covenant is, but are based on certain ratios related to some metrics. Um, so maybe let's go into the direction of what can actually go wrong, right? Because a lot of the, let's say again, in the e-commerce space, Amazon aggregators breach the covenants and yet none of the debt providers took the keys to the house because a bank wouldn't know how to operate an e-commerce company. Neither would SVB know how to operate a software company, for example, right? So. How do you, first of all, like, you know, what are examples of covenants being breached? And then secondly, okay, well, well, what happens if they are breached? Yeah, yeah. So so a covenant is basically a, a, a clause within a contract, right? You know, think about 
a loan agreement. A loan agreement is just a contract, and, and obviously there's a money transfer at the end of it once it's signed, but it's effectively just a piece of paper. It's a contract, right? And they're always pretty complex documents. There's you know, many different ways that they can be written. There's different standards that banks use and lenders use. Um, but if you look at the key terms, that kind of gives you a good feel for what the structure of the facility is. The covenants are there to ensure that the company meets certain conditions so that the bank's risk appetite and, and risk management policies are met. Um, so it's kind of, you know, as, as I was saying about the underwriting methodology and, and the process that we go through with clients, it's all about making sure that the covenants can work because that's how the bank manages its risk. Um, those covenants can be set against PL, they can be set against balance sheet, they can be set against cash flow. Sometimes, quite often, there's two. Um, this is kind of some, you might see this on some venture debt facilities, but not all, but it's starting to go more towards later stage financing. That's when banks start to bring covenants in. They might not put a warrant in anymore. Uh, interest margin typically comes down. So those covenants are there to help give the bank protection. And it's very rare that a covenant breaches and the management team haven't told the bank that it's going to happen. You know, we receive management information from a company 30 to 45 days after month end. Um, ideally, we would like to be told there's probably going to be a covenant breach, you know, three months beforehand, six months beforehand. And it's pretty rare that we have spotted that it might be coming. And it's pretty rare that the management team haven't told us. But without that covenant, there's there's not a, a legal incentive for the borrower to come to the lender and say, hey, guys, we might be a bit off track here. Can we talk about this? Because we might be starting to go away from the plan that we looked at. So that's kind of what the covenant is and why it's there. Right. So what happens, let's say, uh, you know, I borrow some debt and uh, the covenant is something like MRR cannot go down more than 20% um, over, let's say, from the last month or something or, or, or like versus the projection I gave you. Um, so let me, like, let's say I'm, I'm emailing you, hey, by the way, guys, like we lost a few clients. Uh, we are working on getting a few more clients, but it takes us longer. So most likely we're going to breach the covenant. What happens then? Yeah, yeah. So I can only speak for HSBC, IBB, obviously, but, um, but generally speaking, lenders, like you say, aren't the best people to run the business. You know, They don't go into a deficit looking to take the keys of, of the company. And, and it's pretty rare that you hear about that. Normally when that's happened, that's because all of the other avenues have been exhausted, including the lender putting more cash in, including the company doing an equity raise, including the company, you know, doing some kind of disposal or even, you know, selling the whole business. Um, I'd say, you know, first of all, our reaction would always be to understand how the business is off plan, understand the drivers, work with the management team to understand those. In the majority of cases, we just get around the table or, you know, get on Zoom, understand what the financing case should look like over the next couple of years have a look at what covenants we can use to, to rebase those to the financial plan of the, or the rebudget or the reforecast. Um, and more broadly, just understand like, what are management doing, right? Because if the covenant's off track, then most likely management aren't too happy with what's going on, right? Because it's not what everyone's signed up for. So in 99% of cases that I see, there's always a route to the bank or the lender finding a way to soften things or just rebase things. Um, and then you give that a bit of time and make sure that works and then give the company time to recover. Mm -hmm. So that usually means, again, the, the bank tries to create some sort of win-win situation, which just means sometimes just, okay, cool, understood. Um, the terms are as they are, but we basically reformulate the covenant in the contract or maybe something like extend the duration of the facility a bit more but keep the interest the same? Or is there sometimes something like, well, okay, but we have to increase the interest rate in order to justify or you know give you some sort of punishment because otherwise nobody would kind of try to stick with it, right? Yeah, I can see why you think that, but, but typically, certainly in the UK and I think probably in the US as well, regulation makes it pretty difficult for banks to do that. Uh, lenders might do that. There might be some fees in there around if when I say lenders are talking more like funds primarily, there might be some fees if you breach your covenants or if you go off plan. Um, lenders typically, or sorry, funds typically have um, certainly a, a, a higher fee structure. Mm -hmm. Banks typically a bit flexible. So if things are off track, there might be a work fee if there's a legal impact. 
mm. but it's pretty rare that, that the bank would just charge a fee um, because of the breach or because of the work to rebase the covenants. And then maybe to finalize the topic of, you know, let's say what can go wrong, et cetera. But I mean, I've heard of debt to equity swaps, forced sales and disposals. What needs to happen for you guys to say, okay, we've gave you all these exceptions and, you know, leeways. We really need to now auction off the business. It's incredibly rare. I mean, through my 10 years in banking, I'm, I don't think I've ever actually seen that process happen that way. Um, it's because these things don't tend to play out overnight. There's almost always options, right? And the covenant is designed to trip at a point when there is still liquidity in the business. What tends to happen is then you work with management to try and find some options. Sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the liquidity burns right down. Um, the management to really step away and say, we can't find um, you know, a solvent solution here. We need you to sell the business. Um, that really means that management have run out of ideas. And as you know, it's incredibly rare that founders don't have ideas. But in the situations where it does happen, and it it's typically the really big companies you see this with, you know, the, the high profile ones you read about in the newspapers or online, um, it's when the company's business model has a fundamental problem and right. you know, hasn't been able to stay competitive. It might be over leveraged because it's leveraged up in the good times. Those times it can be pretty difficult, but normally there is some value, right? Because the lender wouldn't have lent the business if there wasn't some value in there. So mm -hmm. typically the lender will have some level of realization of, of the assets and, and will therefore be able to pay back the loan or some of the loan. But obviously in that situation, it's terrible for shareholders because the shareholders are going to get nearly wiped out. So yeah. that's very much the doomsday scenario in lending and, and set, certainly secured lending. I think it's really important for any borrower to fully understand that and understand the terms they're signing up to. But it is it's very rare. It's very mm -hmm. rare. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. Cool. And so I guess to finish off, maybe, how do you actually see the financing landscape evolve in the future? Do you see that more innovation comes to and, you know, new products will also be, uh, you know, developed or will will get financing easier or harder? You know, what's your you know projection basically in the next two, three years? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a big question. I think we've only got a few minutes left, so I'll, I'll, I'll try and do it, um, try and do it neatly. But I think the whole lending space has exploded in the last five years, particularly in venture debt, but also in revenue financing, fintechs, non-bank lenders, um, you know, particularly in the UK as well. As a lot of these companies didn't exist five years ago. And I include some banks in there as well. They just weren't focused on our market. Uh, that is great for companies because it means there's far more options in market. Um, but I think, as you mentioned earlier, you know, some lenders have been burned by lending to newer business models, business models maybe that were leveraging up quite quickly and the risks weren't fully understood. So I could see a bit of consolidation um, over the next couple of years. People used to say they'd see banks acquiring some of the fintechs, but that, that, doesn't, that hasn't really happened too much. It's pretty rare that it's happened. Banks predominantly in the UK focus on building their own, their own technology. Um, so I'd be surprised if we see banks going out and acquiring funds, mm -hmm. but that did happen with um, a Canadian bank, which you probably know about, um, I think you mentioned earlier. It, it can happen, but it's pretty rare. So I'd say banks probably getting a little bit sharper about how they structure facilities, starting to look a bit more like a fintech, structuring things with some of the KPIs that, that um, non-bank lenders use. And I think, you know, continued competition, right, which is good for companies. There's going to be more funds coming to market. There's definitely more LPs who are interested in credit rather than equity. They've mm -hmm. realized the returns they can get on that are, are pretty good. Um, so, yeah, I think it's going to continue to be a competitive space for us, but a really good space for, for companies. Cool. Awesome. And then how can people reach you? Uh, LinkedIn's the best. So fortunately, I've got a, a relatively distinctive name. So Luca Rama, search me on Google. I'm, I'm normally the first result on LinkedIn. Connect with me there. I'd, I'd love to hear from different people. Awesome. Look, I really enjoyed this episode. Thank you me so too. much. Thanks for having me. Cheers, Alexei. Right. Bye. To finish off this episode, a little promotion from our end. Neoptima is an award-winning marketing agency for B2B SaaS businesses. We work with companies backed by YC, Sequoia, Carlyle, Lightspeed Ventures, Northzone, and many other top VCs and P investors. We work with venture-backed private equity owned and bootstrapped SaaS businesses all around the world. Reach out to us and book a call in the description below so we can optimize your growth journey.
If you have a fellow founder, if you have a team member, if you are part of a Slack group, Telegram or WhatsApp group with other founders that could get value from this episode, please share this episode with them. We want to help as many founders as possible to scale their business. Thank you for joining us on this journey. See you in the next episode.